Sigmund Husserl is one of the most important and influential figures in 20th century philosophy. And this is despite the fact, or perhaps because of the fact, that he's a particularly difficult philosopher to interpret. His style is extremely recondite. His writings are voluminous, almost to the point of compulsiveness. And he has a tendency to construct neologisms to correspond to the new paths that he's breaking into the realm of the, of the psyche or the realm of the mind. Husserl, uh, his early background was in mathematics, which is very important. Husserl is, uh, perhaps like all mathematicians, is a sort of closet Platonist. I think that mathematicians on the whole tend to look for something universal and abstract in all the thinking that they do. And Husserl, who got his PhD under Weierstrass in Germany in the 1880s, has a definite set of platonic tendencies and commitments. So when you read his philosophy, when you think about Husserl's work, uh, if you were to connect it and uh, think of it in terms of Plato and the Cartesian tradition, the tradition of Western rationalism and idealism, uh, you will be on the right track at the very least. Now, like Descartes, what Husserl wished to do was to construct a new foundation for knowledge. It's a radical epistemological move which attempts to create certainty in the face of contingency and the uncertainty that is generated by the other realms of knowledge. So in some respects, perhaps like Kant, what Husserl's project involves is finding a presuppositionless foundation to human knowledge. And what this would be is a sort of science of sciences that would inform and direct and correct all the other activities of the human mind, including natural science. So what Husserl is trying to do is get down to the Ur stuff, the, the bedrock of the human psyche, and from there to generate all the other realms of knowledge which correspond to it. In some respects, this is like the Cartesian product, project of looking into oneself, and after finding an indubitable foundation for that and for the contents of your mind, to move from there to generating the external world. So, like Descartes, Husserl is working on the assumption that, first of all, the self is self-evident. Right? It's, in other words, it's not controversial that we are selves, and that we have selves, and that we are conscious. He takes that to be simply a given, and that that is indubitable. And not only is that indubitable, the interesting thing about it is that the knowing self, the cogito, is, in Husserl's view, both temporally and logically prior to the world that's known by the cogito. In other words, the knower comes before the known. Right, that has to come first. And if you think about the idealist tradition, all these guys believe that. Think about Descartes. Think about uh, Spinoza. Think about uh, Kant. The whole idealist or rationalist tradition tends to emphasize inwardness, inter internality. And perhaps that's the most, not only an important characteristic of Husserl, but I would be inclined to say that that's one of the most characteristic moves, the characteristic intellectual deployments of continental philosophy. In other words, unlike the Anglo-American tradition, which looks outward like Hume and develops a theory of ex the external world, and then afterwards, as a sort of postscript to that activity, develops a theory of the psyche, of the mind, of what's internal to a human being, well, the continental tradition does the opposite. They start out with a theory of what's inside, and then from there they try and work outwards. And both the Anglo-American tradition and the continental tradition suffer from a sort of common problem. When they try and make the jump, from one realm, the external, what we might call the exocosm, to the, what, the, the internal realm, the psyche, the soul, or the mind, or what, what we might call the introcosm, there's always a problem in making and leaping that hurdle. And it doesn't really matter which side you start on, the problem is always going to be the same. How do we move from one part of the hurdle to the other? How do we move from the beginning to the end? So when you look at Husserl, when you look at this, this uh, Cartesian continental tradition, keep that in mind. They're starting out with, a, in, with the internal facts of human consciousness and generating the world from that. Okay? So it's a different problematic, a different starting point. And that's what you keep in mind when you look at Husserl. Now, corresponding to this way of developing a philosophy is the hope of getting certain knowledge, like Descartes. Descartes' whole project of radical skepticism was to develop a knowledge that was foundational and completely certain. Husserl is trying to do the same thing. He's a sort of neo-Cartesian. And much of his work, when you actually start to read the stuff that he's published, because um, although he produced a tremendous amount of writing, most of what he produced was not published in his lifetime. 
and he was in a voluminous writing, he produced almost 45,000 pages of work, and it tends to be very repetitive. It is methodological for the most part, and particularly programmatic. In other words, what his writings are about is how we engage in a method, which he calls phenomenology, which will allow us to discern these eternal essences that exist within the human psyche. And once we identify these essences, then we will know ourselves. And once we know ourselves clearly, and in a way that can't be doubted, that can't be called into question, then, and only then, can we construct all the other elements of knowledge. So what he wants is, what he described as, philosophy as a rigorous science which is a very radical sort of an idea. I mean, by the 20th century, I think very few thinkers are willing to say that philosophy is not only a rigorous science, but it's the foundation, the, the or knowledge of all other possible cognition. So this is a long, it, 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 it's a play that tries to go for all the marbles. He's trying to win the big philosophical game. And if he fails to do that, and I think that he does, and I think that his project is a failure, I think that we have to admire the sort of nobility which tries to take on a huge intellectual project like that. In many respects, because Husserl himself, as a, as a man rather than as a philosopher, was a kind of a saintly individual. He was conspicuous for his dedication and his devotion and his moral seriousness to philosophy. I would almost be tempted to compare him to sort of a Don Quixote of philosophy. We all laugh at the results or at, of Don Quixote's misadventures because, well, they're silly and he misunderstands the way the world works. But on the other hand, no one laughs at Don Quixote's intentions. They are intrinsically noble and we, 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 cannot have, we have no choice but to admire that. I kind of feel that way about Husserl. I think that the project, well, never, not only does it not complete itself, it never, never completely gets started. And it's probably impossible to do. But I sort of admire the idea of unifying all of knowledge. It is a sort of quest for the Holy Grail. And even if we never find it, there is something excellent about the quest. So, and, and I say this initially in my treatment of Husserl because I'm going to be kind of hard on him a little later on. So, without being too hard, I think that we should give him a little bit of slack because he's trying to do something that, if it is not impossible, is certainly exceedingly difficult. Much more ambitious than the local, small, um, individual product, projects characteristic of the Anglo-American tradition. Now, first off, he starts out with the idea of certainty and intuition. In other words, if we're going to examine ourselves in a phenomenological way, if we're going to pursue this method of phenomenology, um, we're going to have to find out well, what the standard, or what the procedure for knowing things is, I mean, what phenomenology involves as a method, what it investigates, and how it investigates. Those are always all going to be informed, and since this is a methodological project, right, it makes sense to, to talk about how we do this as opposed to what we do. Or as opposed to what we do. And the big, one of the big issues here is the question of intuition. Now, I guess, uh, perhaps when uh, you hear me use a word like intuition, particularly because we live in contemporary America, we are in the fall of the Anglo-American tradition, you perhaps think that I should put that in italics. Because intuition is a kind of fishy, kind of mushy, kind of messy sort of a category. And I want to start out suggesting that that's not the case. And that in fact it might be true some of the time, but I can imagine intuitions, and I'm going to help you imagine some intuitions, which are not only not controversial, but they're not mushy and they're really not doubtable. Here's some ideas. Um, let me ask you some questions. I have an, a studio audience here, which is live and kind of helps me out. Um, I'd like your information or your answers to these questions. First of all, do I have a headache? You don't know. And how about, do I hope someday to be elected president? You don't know. Do I like spinach? You don't know. My point is, is that I can answer these questions even though you can't. I know if I have a headache or not. And what would somebody else, external to me, presume to tell me that, no, I don't have a headache? You're going to correct me on that matter? No, of course not. It's silly. All right? Well, may I suggest that my knowledge of my headache is a direct intuition of my experience, my psychic state. All right? And I don't need anybody else to help me out here. And if you, if you doubt that, you say, no, Mike, you don't have a headache. What am I supposed to do? Do some math and show you that I do? Or should we go to the lab and will I do some experiments and show you that I have a headache? Can you see why that project is silly I and mean, we wouldn't gesture at something external to my experience of the world in order to validate the proposition that I have a headache? Intuition, then, perhaps is not so gooey as we might imagine. There are certain things which we validate just by gesturing at our experience. In that respect, oddly enough, phenomenology, Husserl's method, and empiricism, the method of somebody like David Hume, because, even though they are so different in many respects, share a common property, is that they're all ultimately based on our experience. Hume's phenomenalism, his empiricism, is based on our, ex uh, on our experience of the external world, observing it. Husserl's phenomenology, alternatively, is based on our experience of the internal world. And it reduces only to that, and there's nothing further that we can gesture at. 
So, on the one hand, I would recommend that you look at this with a certain degree of skepticism. In other words, intuition can be a very fishy category, it can be nebulous, and it can be a simple refusal to give reasons for what you believe. And usually the refusal to give a reason philosophically for what you believe is a way of saying that you don't have a reason for what you believe. But my point is that that's not always the case. If you think about the idea of intuition in terms of questions like, do I have a headache? I believe you will realize that I'm the only one who knows that. And that it's not absurd or meaningless for me to say that I have a headache. All right? So I'm just trying to, to establish the idea of intuition as not being intrinsically preposterous. All right? Now, um, Husserl was a student of Brentano, which is an interesting fact because Freud was also one of Brentano's students. And from Brentano, apparently a very influential teacher, um, he borrowed, as Freud did, the idea of intentionality. And that's the same, well, it revolves around the proposition that the facts of mental life, of our psychic life, are irreducible. In other words, we can't talk about love and hate and hope and guilt and lust in terms of chemicals. Freud liked the idea that ultimately we, we could reduce one to the other, but in practice, he treated it as a sort of autonomous inquiry into the mind. Well, something analogous is happening when we look at Husserl. He believes that the, the facts of mental life are irreducible and they're real. And not only are they irreducible and real, but they come first. In other words, what Husserl wants to do is like that, is like the project of Descartes. He wants to construct the self first and out of that build nature. Rather than, say, the, uh, the empiricist project of constructing nature first and then, later on, constructing the self. So the self comes first, and how do you find out about yourself? Intuition. Right? And the reason why it's important for me to establish intuition is because elsewise this seems like a tremendously nebulous and sort of baggy activity, but in fact it potentially could be more precise than one might immediately imagine. Now what's the problem Husserl wants to solve? Well, in one of his most accessible books, and if you intend to read Husserl, which can be quite trying, I would recommend you try a, a Philosophy and the Crisis of European Man. It's one of his last works. It's written in 30. It's published in 36. It's written in the 30s, and he dies in 38. And the reason why that's a good introduction to Husserl is because it's easier to figure out what Husserl is against than it is to figure out what Husserl is for. And what he's against are things like historicism, relativism, psychologism, scientism, and what he's gesturing at here is the whole tendency of thought since the Enlightenment, which tends to move away from theological or more precisely metaphysical structures towards an emphasis on the empirical external world. Perhaps this is a homage to the rise of modern natural science, but Husserl says that the rise of modern natural science has misled us, has caused us to misunderstand the world around us, and has put philosophy on the wrong footing. The result of this has been an impoverishment of our culture. In some ways, I would say that Husserl's concerns are fundamentally cultural. He's putting together this, epistemo this epistemological project in order to rescue us from the degeneration into a sort of pure materialism. What Husserl thinks, at least Husserl's self-conception is, that what he's doing is he's renewing and reviving the Platonic and Aristotelian tradition of Greek rationalism, where our logos, our rationality, applies to the whole domain of human experience. Let us juxtapose that to uh, the tradition of scientism that we see in Mach and Avenarius and all those positivistic Germans. Um, there, he calls that the, the tradition of Democritus. Those of you who know the, pre the, uh, the, the Greek philosopher Democritus will know that he reduced the world to atoms in the void. Well, in some ways, that's what modern scientific project has done. And Husserl says that is a wrong turn. We have moved down an intellectual cul-de-sac there. So what he's trying to say is that we must go back to ourselves. It's very interesting to know about the things in the world external to us. But the real important thing is for us to know ourselves. And once we know ourselves, then we will be able to construct our, ex our knowledge of the external world on an indubitable foundation. But if we start with the external world and its contingency and its messiness and its lack of certainty, all our other intellectual activities, including our knowledge of ourself, is going to reflect that same contingency and uncertainty. So while the project may not be entirely successful, the, the problem that he's formulating is in fact reasonable and serious and ought to be taken with, with great care. So we're going to move against uh, the general tendency of Western culture since the breakup of the Middle Ages. Um, there is a decidedly scholastic element to Husserl's work as well, an infinite working out of carefully constructed logical oppositions in a sort of tautological way. Uh, the construction of elaborate tautologies is perhaps one of the characteristic philosophical problems of mathematicians who eventually become philosophers.
And what were they doing when they, in, in their training? Constructing tautologies and working out the implications of definitions. Well, that's what Husserl's whole project is. It's that he moves from the domain of space or quantity to the whole domain of human experience. So, a noble and exciting project. Let's dive into it and see if we can make some sort of sense out of it. Husserl is worried, right? When he's writing philosophy and the crisis of European man, let's think about his context. He was a professor at the University of Freiburg until 1933, when he was dismissed from his post because he was a Jew. Right? National Socialism comes in, and he gets replaced by one of his students, Martin Heidegger. And at that time, it seems clear enough to Husserl that Western culture is collapsing. One of the results of this Democritian tradition, as opposed to the revived Platonic Aristotelian tradition, is that the fact-value distinction emerges. We get various kinds of relativisms. We get various kinds of will-to-power voluntaristic philosophies. All of these, according to Husserl, are a sign of cultural degeneration. And the source of this cultural degeneration is our lack of knowledge of ourselves and the world around us. So what he's trying to do is sort of a... Um, like Ajax, I don't know if you know, if you know the, uh, the Iliad, but Ajax preventing uh, the Trojans from burning the Greek ships, he stands there and will not move. And there's something tremendously heroic about it, even though he may be fighting phantom battles. Right? He thinks, at least, that what he's doing is absolutely essential to the project of our culture. And the problem that we're going to find, or one of the problems we're going to find in this procedure of looking into ourselves is that it could easily become frivolous or arbitrary. In other words, once I look into myself, I suppose I could tell you the immediate contents of my experience, but the problem is that that would be arbitrary and completely subjective. That's not going to give us an ultimate foundation. So we have to do something with our looking into ourselves, with our turning inward. And what Husserl wants to do is use a method for examining the contents of our psyche, and that method will be called phenomenology. What he will do is something called the epoche, which, he, which is a, uh, a translation of the idea of suspension. Like Descartes, when he says, I'm going to doubt the whole external world, what Husserl wants to do is, first of all, suspend the whole external world. Now, it's not that he, he disbelieves in it. In other words, he's not being skeptical of the existence of tables and chairs, the way Descartes did in Discourse on Method. He's not denying their existence. He's just saying that the whole external world is irrelevant, bracketed. Right? In the strict mathematical sense of bracketing a problem, because remember, the end's training is a math, mathematician. So we're going to bracket the problem of the external world and leave out all that stuff. All right? And bracketing the external world means that we're going to leave out a great deal of human experience. For example, um, this will leave out things like uh, uh, cause and effect relationships. Why? Because as Hume points out, we don't see cause and effect in the world. We just see one thing happening after another. All scientific theorems will be left out. Mathematical deductions will be left out. We're going to be left with the pure, raw data of being a human being. And what Husserl thinks is that there's something common to all of us that we're going to discern there. You might think of it as something like this. Um, you know what, a, uh, what it is to sift out sand, to look for something hidden in the sand? What he's trying to do is sift out the contents of human experience and find out the stuff that doesn't pass through the mesh of phenomenology. What, gets held, what we hold on to there will be what Husserl calls an essence, some invariable, necessary quality to human experience. And when we collect these essences together and reduce them still further, uh, I think oh, um, we, what we will get is some common or stuff of the human psyche. Okay. Um, also think of the idea of reduction. Reduction is a funny word. Um, from Latin, it means to lead back. We're going to be led back to our original kind of primal consciousness. Another way of thinking of reduction would be the idea of boiling down. Imagine the consciousness is a big whale, and you're going to put it in a pot and, and boil away all the stuff that's irrelevant so that you can get to something that's essential and structural and permanent there. And this longing for something essential and structural and permanent, can't you hear the ghost of Plato here? Right? And it's, a typical, it's the typical intellectual move of somebody that's been trained in mathematics. Right? And this has had a tremendous influence on the subsequent development of continental philosophy, particularly people like Heidegger. Now... In the process of developing this presuppositionless philosophy, what we're going to find out is something like the shape of the ego's transparent cage. Like Kant, he's going to tell us what the necessary limitations of our experience are. And once he's done that, he will think that he has done it permanently for all of time in the way that any mathematician would. Now, the problem is to find some certain knowledge with which to combat historicism, or we get in Diltai, or scientism, that we get the positivists, or various kinds of relativism. And the way we're going to do that 
is by boiling down with this epoche. And in the first case, what we'll do is we will have a sort of purified subjectivity. We will boil it down till we get to the essential constructs from which human minds are made. And the result will be that authentic reality will be disclosed. We're going to suspend our belief in the external world and just examine what's left over. And what's left over after we perform this kind of, a, of an activity of reduction will be uh, uh, these essences that are permanent and eternal. And he will know then the structure of the human mind. And these will always be, they will always have a certain simil similar set of uh, characteristics. And phenomenological statements will result from this phenomenological, phenomenological examination of the internal contents of our psyche. And the key thing here is that it's not empirical in the sense that I can observe that and have it be an empirical activity. It will be descriptive, but it won't describe anything out there. It's going to describe exclusively the stuff that's in here. All right? So it's going to be a descriptive theory of the intro process. Right? And what he's looking for is absolute certainty without presuppositions, and it will always be about internal intentional actions. What he's trying to do here is derive a priori statements. And what, remember, if you remember Kant, what an a priori statement is, is it has at least two qualities. One, it's non-empirical, and two, it's necessarily true. So what he wants to find is to generate, after looking into his own psyche in this phenomenological way, sifting out the contingent and the arbitrary and the irrelevant, is a priori certain truths about what it means to be a human being. Kant uberalis once again. Now, the problem, uh, you, you might want to say that after this reduction, what we're getting is something like immediate, direct apprehension of what the scholastics called universals. All right, we're looking directly into the self, and since the self constructs and projects the world, what we're going to do is cogitate ourselves and bootstrap ourselves into some permanent reality. Now, there are many difficulties with this. Um, some of them we should, we should look at directly. First of all, there are very few examples of Husserl's work of actually doing this. One of the problems with phenomenology, the nebulous, baggy quality about it, is that he says that the, the first thing we have to do is figure out what the phenomenological method is, and the way we develop the phenomenological method is to use phenomenology on itself, to inspect yourself. So there's something kind of fishy going on here. In order to find out what a phenomenon is, remember in Greek, phenomenon is that which is disclosed, that which is apparent and directly known. Well, in order to find out what a phenomenon is, one of the things we're going to do is reduce the idea of the phenomenon to find out what that essentially is, and from there we'll be able to move directly on. So it's a method that hopes to pull itself up by its bootstraps, and I have some problems logically with, with this activity. Um, let me give you some examples to kind of flesh this out, make this a little bit easier to, to concretely think about. And uh, Husserl himself was generating things like uh, investigations of phenomenon, but also ideas like number, meaning, truth, pure abstractions that he believes are common to all cognitive beings. And in every case, we end up with some sort of a circle, what he calls the epistemological circle, and at other times the methodological circle. The reasoning always ends up being circle, but of course, if you're going to restrict yourself to the domain of internality, what else could you be doing but talking about circular things in a circular way? Where is there to go? It's almost not even a circle, it's something like a point. It, doesn't, it almost lacks that interior quality. Um, and his method, or the, the method that he uses often, more often than any other, because it's very difficult to figure out exactly what this amounts to, is what he calls free imaginative variation. And let's see what that's like. That's how we search for essences. And what we're going to do is think of something. Let's take a, a human being as something that I'm going to do a phenomenological reduction. I'm going to think about that problem now. Cogitating with me. All right. All right, let's give this a, a shot. Um, what we're going to do is attribute pred predicates to this thing, human being, and then add and subtract them in our imagination and see which of, them, which of these predicates we believe we can dispense with and which we believe we cannot dispense with. We're, we're, and then we'll make two categories. The ones we can dispense with, which are the contingent things we're trying to get rid of, that's the sand we're sifting away, and the things we can't dispense with, which, is, which are the essences, and that's what we'll be looking for. I'll give you an example. Is it true that we, ha we necessarily have to attach the, pre the following predicate to the human mind? That the human mind is good at math. Is that true of every human mind? No, I, I, I'm bad at math. I, mean, I know for a fact that it's not true of every human mind. I'm no good at math. Let's try another one. The human mind forgets birthdays. Well, that's a predicate, but some human minds remember birthdays. How about this one? The human mind is self-conscious. Do you think you could dispense with that? No, I mean, it's built right into the idea of what we mean by being a human mind. Right? 
So what we're doing here is attributing a great number of predicates. One of the great problems here is it seems to me there are an infinite number of predicates. We're never going to get, or we're never going to finish the first thing we try and reduce, much less do all the other reductions that are going to be necessary to engage in this project. But what, at least this is an instantiation of what the guy is trying to do, to separate the necessary from the unnecessary, the inessential from the essential predicates. And once you have the whole list of essential predicates of a thing, now you know what it is. And then you get these things that are defined now as their essences, right, just the essential predicates, and then we start to boil that down again. And you keep on boiling until you get to complete disclosure of what it means to be a human being. I think this is a pretty fishy way of doing this. I think the idea of trying to find out what it's like to be a human being inwardly is an interesting thought. The difficulty is, is that in practice, it's awfully hard to talk about these things. Now, here's the first difficulty. Truth conditions. How do we know which of these predicates are the essential ones? Help me out here. <laughs> and, uh, I can imagine some which it seems fairly clear. Uh, triangles have to have the property of having three sides. I can believe that. I mean, that, that's not too controversial. But I can imagine cases where it wouldn't be clear, even among phenomenologists, and there, where there might be a lack of agreement. And I'm not quite sure how we go about finding that out. And even if, uh, and if I just look at it from my own perspective, in those leave out the, the social interaction between phenomenologists, I look at it in my case, and I say, all right, so I've decided that one of the essential predicates of human being is the fact that it is self-conscious. That's just fine. Now, suppose I'm uncertain about that. Well, I guess I can't be uncertain about it because I, I found out by introspection, and I'm, I'm certain of all the things that I introspect. So I guess I can't be uncertain about that. But suppose I talk to one of my students, and I say, kid, one of the essential properties of the human mind is that it's self-conscious. He says, Professor, how do you know? And what does it do? Pound the table and say, look, don't ask me how I know. I looked inside myself and I know. That's not a very satisfactory answer, and you get the sense that there's no real way to gesture at this. The difficulty that we're gonna, we're gonna find is something like this. I can say, look, I'll do it right now. I, I intuited this yesterday. I looked inside myself and I found out that one of the essential properties of the human being is that it should be self-conscious. And if you don't believe me, I'm gonna do it now. I'm gonna sit here introspect and yeah i'm definitely right i've done the phenomenological reduction i've bracketed the world and take my word for it this is really the case now we would like this to be a universal logical procedure we would like this to be univocal my sense is that in practice it is not problem number one uh what it reminds me of one of the things that sort of ruins husserl for a man is if you have been exposed to ludwig wittgenstein before you do husserl because Wittgenstein's work is a wonderful way of dissolving these kind of problems. In other words, Wittgenstein says he doesn't want to talk about whether this is true or false. He says, look, the whole problem is misconceived, and that's the real difficulty we have here. And let's think about the, what, what the criticism of this is going to be. What Husserl thinks he's doing when he finds out what the essence of a human being is, he thinks he's finding out something about the universal structure of the human mind. And that all people have to think that because these words, these terms like human being, correspond to natural kinds in the world, and the natural kinds in the world correspond to natural categories in, in human cognition. My point is, that's probably not true. Wittgenstein would help, would help us out here. Wittgenstein says, I want to leave, I want to lead the fly out of the fly bottle. Husserl is a guy walking around, uh, or a lot like a fly, walking around inside the fly bottle, unable to get out. Here's the problem. Instead of essences being a quality intrinsic to the human mind, Wittgenstein will point out that essences are a quality intrinsic to a particular language. So that when you find out that uh, self-consciousness is a necessary predicate for essence, you're not finding out the, the, some quality about the human mind intrinsically, which corresponds to essence. What you're finding out is about the way we, we use the word essence in the English language. Right? So Wittgenstein, by dissolving this, could have saved, I mean, if he'd just been born, if they'd been born a generation apart, you know, in other words, if Wittgenstein had come a generation before, and, and instead of Husserl coming a generation before, he could have saved the guy an awful lot of handwriting. Right, because look, the whole idea is wrong. There's no such thing as an essence. And what you're trying to do, what you're doing is reifying language and treating it as a model of the psyche. And this is wrong. Right? Uh, there was a wonderful, I mean, think about my, my hypothetical situation with my student. Where I said, look, I intuited this yesterday. I, I did the phenomenological reduction. I'm going to do it now. And believe me, this will confirm what I said yesterday, that, uh, that the essence of human, of consciousness is, uh, of human being is consciousness. This is a lot like what Wittgenstein said when he said, look, suppose you bought a newspaper and you had some doubt as to what the story meant, or, or the, of the truth of a given story on page one. How would you find out if the story was true? Well, there are different ways you might do that, but one way that you wouldn't do that is to go out and buy another copy of the same paper. Right? Now you see the point? So when I, when I said, look, I'm going to intuit this again for you, what I'm doing is I'm buying another copy of the same paper. This doesn't tell us anything, and this can't tell us anything. I can buy an infinite number of copies of the same paper, but it's still not going to tell us anything. 
See the difficulty here? He's trapped within the intracosm, and he can't figure out how to get out. And neither can I if I follow this procedure. Now can you see why this is going to be an extremely nebulous kind of philosophy? It was made very hard to talk about um, how we move from my internal consciousness of certain facts of the psyche to yours. The difficulty here is that when we turn inward, and when we get an unmediated, a symbolically unmediated knowledge of anything internal to my psyche, the lack of those symbols, that lack of mediation between me and these objects, right, means that it's real hard for me to talk about them later on. All right? And that means that it comes very close to talking to yourself. Right? And that is the opposite of what philosophy ought to be, right? In the way, that's a betrayal of the Platonic and Aristotelian tradition. The idea of logos demands that knowledge not just be rational, but that it be communicable. That's one of the canons of rationality. And Husserl comes up to the barriers of language, which Husserl, or what, what Wittgenstein calls the limits of what can be said. And he'd like to step over, but he never quite manages to do it. Right? So that's the kind of problem that comes up again and again and again. Now, towards the end of his life, um, he developed uh, the idea of the Lebenswelt, the life world, and this turn is toward the imminence of human experience and human consciousness. Let me see if I can explain this idea. Um, what he wants to do is to look at the world as it appears to human beings, as it is given in human experience, as opposed to the impersonal, abstract experience of the world that we get from our study of modern natural science. In other words, um, science tells us, for example, that time goes on indefinitely. Human beings don't experience time like that. They have a very limited span in the world. Right? That's one of the big differences. Concrete time is human time, my life. Abstract time is just T sub 1, T sub 2, T sub N. It goes on forever. Very, in other words, science abstracts and to that extent somewhat falsifies the reality of human experience. Right? Um, he spends a lot of time discussing uh, his views on time and his views on internal time consciousness. That's the kind of thing that phenomenology would be suited to if we could ever get something done out of it. The difficulty is this. Husserl spends a lot of his time, most of his career, not actually doing phenomenology, I mean applying this method, but rather figuring out what this method is. Right? And refining it and trying to explain how it is we're going to do something later on as soon as we figure out how to do it. All right, and some at some it appears. I mean, from my reading of this, which has been most unsatisfactory, it has because I mean the, 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 re, the philosophy itself is in many respects quite nebulous. Um, the best understanding I can come away with is this: that at some point in the indif in the indefinite future, we will find out precisely what this method is, and I mean precisely, mathematically, Cartesian in that, in that sense. And then after we find out precisely what the method is, at some point in the indefinite future, we will then actually be able to apply it to something and get some results at some indefinite point beyond that. And then after that, at some indefinite point, after we've gotten all these essences and assembled them all in a lovely array, then we'll have some idea of what exactly we can do with it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm told initially that the whole point of it is to give us an indubitable foundation to knowledge. I would hope so, but it seems like we have to act on faith to a great extent because it's very hard for him to communicate with uh, to us directly what it is that we're supposed to do with this and how it is we're supposed to do it. The best phenomenologists dispute uh, questions like this. A further problem that we're going to get out of this neo-Cartesian kind of a project is the question of other minds. Descartes always had a problem. I mean, he didn't have any problem explaining how he knew he existed and what his existence was like. But he always ran up against a sort of glass barrier when he tried to explain what grounds we have for believing in the reality of other people's psyche. Why is this not a kind of wilderness of objects? And he thinks that there are other minds, but he can't quite explain why or how. And Husserl is doing something very much like that. He says, that, among, among other things, that we find out about human minds through something that is phenomenologically present to us, empathy. Alas, he doesn't have a, a satisfactory phenomenological analysis of empathy. He kind of pounds the desk and insists that, yes, there are other minds, yes, we can know them, and yes, we do so through empathy. And to be honest, I think that that's kind of, in a pre-philosophic kind of common sense way, that's true. I mean, how else are you going to find it about other minds? I don't know why we need a philosophy to tell us this. Right? I don't know why we need this elaborate uh, procedure in order to be able to affirm it. Right? I don't think that he really made any progress along those lines. Here's the issue. Right? Let's, let's drop back a little bit to think about what the difficulty we have here is. He wants to turn inward, and he also wants to talk. And the advantage of the Anglo-American tradition is that by concentrating on external stuff on the public world, it's relatively easy to say what you're talking about, to refer directly to things in the world, because they're public, they're external, they're here. 
When I turn inward, it's very hard to make these questions public. And here's the difficulty. The temptation that the Anglo-American tradition has is to just abolish the internal work. Remember, I mean, think of the, uh, of the idea that we get with Locke and Hume, that the psyche is a kind of an empty box, a tabula rasa, and all these impressions get sent in, and then we associate them into that association of psychology, and that's what the mind is. It's a, it's a bundle of sensations. But that is an impoverished view of human experience. I mean, if you stop and think about it, nobody, nobody views the world and experiences the world as a bundle of sensations. Here's the difficulty. If we follow the Anglo-American tradition, and we insist on the accuracy and precision of our speech, all we're able to talk about is the external world. Their statements about what goes on inside, in other words, the Anglo-American empiricists can't make the jump from the outside in. And that's why their theory of the internal world is so impoverished, and it doesn't really persuade anybody. Right? It's, in other words, the Anglo-American tradition is a theory of the things that are easy to talk about. Right? The difficulty is, is that there are more things on heaven and earth that are dreamt of in your philosophy. I have an internal life. I experience the world that way. And although these things are difficult to talk about, I feel the need to say something about them, even if it is unclear and nebulous. Can you see then what the continental response to that is? Um, what they're going to do is sacrifice precision in order to enlarge the domain of discourse. It is possible to truncate the domain of discourse, as the Anglo-American tradition does, and you get an increased resolution in, in the precision of your speech, but this resolution is, costs a very high price. You lose all of the internal reality. Right? You lose the internal world. They deny there is an internal world. What they, that sort of procedure will lead to is something like behavioral psychology, Pavlov and Watson and Skinner, where there is no mind to talk about. Now here, here's the difficulty. If you follow that sort of scientific Anglo-American path, what you're going to get is a very elegant and precise set of verbal canons which account for the world around us, but don't do a very good job of telling you about yourself. And what Husserl and the Cartesians of various stripes will say is that if you don't know yourself, how are you going to know the world? Right? What the Del or Oracle Delphi says, know thyself. It's a precondition for knowledge. On the other hand, if you want to stay on the inside, the difficulty is, is that we are unable to get even the most basic or foundational gestures at this content across to other people. I know very well about my internal mental states. It's a, I have a hard time getting them across to you. Much of Ludwig Wittgenstein's work was an attempt to bridge this gap, but it's very, very difficult and at least mysterious and startling formations. What Husserl did, and put a pounding on the desk in, the, in a kind of Cartesian way, is to construct the idea of intersubjectivity. In other words, the way in which these phenomenological psyches, these transcendental egos, communicate with each other is, or, or the matrix in which they communicate with each other, is his idea of intersubjectivity, an idea which is never completely or clearly defined. It allows us to form a sort of linguistic or verbal community with other minds. And I mean, I kind of naively believe that there is such a thing, but he isn't able to give any very satisfactory account of it. And the reason why is the structure I was, gener I was gesturing at just a little while ago. All these continental guys, if you look at yourself, it's hard to break out of this solipsistic circle. If you start on the outside, the problem is you can't get into your own mind. And you started out as a mind, there are problems with both sides. What I'm trying to do here is something like this. Not to vindicate or justify Husserl, because I think that probably isn't going to work. Right? In many respects, you may want to think that of Husserl as being German romanticism, Cartesianized. The lonely, German, the lonely uh, ego of Schiller or Goethe, right? given a sort of mathematical Cartesian formulation. Right? And he insists in a kind of romantic way that I am a self, I know I am conscious, and look, I can't doubt that, it's just, that's the fact of the matter, I'm gonna, on, on this rock I will build my church. Right? Well, I can see how you might have a certain desire to do that, my problem is, is that we're always going to end up either talking to ourselves or constructing arbitrary commonsensical bridges from our philosophical solipsism into the regular world of everyday practice. Right? And that's built into the idea of this project that all the continental thinkers are involved with. So what I'm asking for in some respects is that you cut the continental philosophers a little bit of slack because of the fact that the project they have undertaken is probably impossible. I mean, it, it may well be just impossible to talk about the internal facts of my psychic states. 
or it is so with a great deal of difficulty and a great deal of cloudiness. It is not any particular problem with Husserl or, these, or any specific philosopher. It is built into that kind of project of making, of bridging this gap between what's inside and what's outside. But here's the down, here's the alternative. We can go to the Anglo-American tradition. I mean, when Professor Staloff and I have this argument essentially all the time, all right? Because I mean, you, neither one is completely satisfactory. Well, if you start out with the external world, you're never going to get a sense of yourself. You're never going to be able to talk about these internal facts, and that means that you'll have to impoverish the vocabulary of our experience. In other words, the problem with, with, um, with Hume or with any of these Anglo-American empiricists is I just don't experience the world like that. And I think that that's a very fair objection. Let me give you an, an example. I'd have to make an analogy here, and this would make, perhaps make this whole difference between the Anglo-Americans and the Continentals more apparent. Let's try the idea of going to a tailor and getting a suit of clothes. You know, it's a simple everyday thing. Go to a tailor, and he measures you, and you come back next week and you've got your suit of clothes. And you put on the jacket, and you find that the jacket only has one arm. The tailor says, well, if the jacket only has one arm, your body is wrong. And the customer might well say, well, no, no, hold it, let me get this straight now. My body is wrong and your suit is right? No, that's, not, that's insane. I mean, that's not the idea here. In other words, my body starts out being right. I, I'm sure that this is how I'm shaped. And that if you only have one sleeve in your jacket, change the jacket. The jacket is wrong, not my body. And if the tailor says, no, that's, so, you know, that's absurd of you, you really have to remove that arm. <laughs> that's crazy. I'm not removing my arm. You're definitely putting in a, another arm to this jacket. In other words, do we change our body to suit our jacket? Or do we change our jacket to suit our body? Now let me suggest that our body is the set of our experiences and that the jacket is the philosophical theory with which we account for them. You really want to cut off your experience of cause and effect, of good and evil, of lust and rage and hatred and beauty, um, because you can't talk about them precisely? Or is this demand for philosophical precision taken to an unreasonable extreme? In other words, when a... When A.J. Ayer, for our, it was Ayer that has the view that say, more moral theory is non-cognitive, right? Well, I experience morals, at least sometimes, as being real and right and wrong. If these Anglo-American guys, these real hard-shell empiricists, tell me that my experience is wrong, it's like the tailor telling me my body's wrong. Don't tell me that I'm experiencing the world wrong. No, your theory is wrong. And if it doesn't correspond to my experience, then fix the theory. Don't tell me to fix my experience. My experience comes first. Now, can you see the strength of Husserl's point? Right? This is a devastating sort of an argument, and in my, perspective, in my view, it's actually true. In other words, I think that Husserl's attempt to find a way out of this labyrinth just doesn't work. Right? He's spinning his wheels, he's caught in a snowdrift. But the idea of telling to these scientific, empirical, rational, logical guys that if your theory doesn't correspond to my experience, your theory is wrong, not my experience, I think that's right on the money. And I think that's the strong point of all continental philosophies. They say, I'm going to look at myself and the way I experience the world first. And if your theory corresponds to that and accounts for that, so, so be it. If it doesn't, I am not going to say, well, look, I'll stop giving, I'll give up on beauty, I'll give up on morality, I'll give up on all my psychic states, all my emotions, because after all, either I talk about them clearly or I don't talk about them at all. No. This demand for clarity has been taken to an unreasonable extreme. It would be much better for us if we were to start with experience, or uh, as Husserl's uh, slogan was, to the things themselves. Well, modify that a bit. Let's start with experience. Let's, let's make our slogan experience first. Me first. And then I'll construct my world around that. I'm not going to construct myself around the world. That's insane. It's like, it's like changing my body to suit my suit. That's crazy. This is the strong point of Husserl. And if it doesn't ultimately offer us intuition of the essence of being, or whatever it is that he's trying to do here, if it doesn't offer us the ultimate structure of human cognition, it does make an important point against the problem of Western philosophy, uh, against the problem that Western philosophy has drifted into. It makes the point that I come first. And that's what phenomenology is. In other words, if you leave out all the verbiage and the elaborate intellectual apparatus that he constructs, it all proceeds from the basic intuition that I, my experience is right. And any theory that tells me my experience is mistaken is fundamentally, uh, has a cart before the horse. All right? And I think that's what holds together the whole tradition of continental philosophy in the 20th century. This will be true for Husserl, but it's also going to be true for Heidegger, it's going to be true for Bergson, it's going to be true for all these guys that start out looking at themselves. All right? And if they get nebulous and fuzzy, well, that's just built into the problem. I think uh, another, way, another analogy that we can bring to this is that um, it's like singing. The precision of our diction 
costs something. The precision of our thinking and speech costs something. Um, we can loosen up the diction so it's not so precise what we're saying, but we can gain in range. We can hit the high notes intellectually. And I think that talking about right and wrong and talking about beauty and talking about the really important things psychically, those are the high notes of philosophy. And the problem is that the empiricists can't hit those notes. They have better diction than I do, but you can hit the high notes like this. And this is what it's for. And so for all the nebulous and dubious and perhaps even mystical qualities that we find in Husserl, this is a serious and worthwhile attempt to account for what it means to be an ego in the 20th century.